During the second British Lions tour to South Africa of 1896, 24-year-old Barry Ferry Heaty became the fifth South African rugby captain. As captain, Heaty was responsible for choosing the team jersey. He decided to go with the colours of his alma mater and by doing so, he unwittingly etched his name into Springbok rugby folklore. How's it? My name is Dr. Jakob Seynert, this is Stashi, and you're watching The Historian's Locker. Barry Heaty was born in the district of Worcester in the heart of the Western Cape in 1872. He was part of a big sporting family with an emphasis on big. He had eight other brothers, two of whom also going on to represent South Africa at rugby. Barry only started to play rugby at the age of 17, which in South Africa is considered quite late in life. But his talent was noticed very quickly, because while he was still a schoolboy at the Diocesan College, also known as Bishops in Cape Town, he was not only picked for Western Province, but also became their captain. Baza was strong, confident and a natural ball player. He was a giant of his time, standing at 6 foot 3, which made him a formidable rock. To complement his towering frame, Old Baza also had a forceful personality. Perhaps it was for this reason that he was ironically nicknamed Fairy. Fagalus? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. No, 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 no. Then, at the age of only 19, he was selected to play for the first ever South African international side against the touring British side of 1891. Five years later, the British were returning to South African shores and Ferry was one of the first Oaks to be considered for the test team to meet them. By 1896, South Africa was still not a united political entity and the clouds of war between the British Empire and the two Boer Republics were gathering once again. A plan conceived by Cecil John Rhodes to instigate a rebellion from within the Transvaal Republic had failed a year before. The plan known as the Jamison Raid, ended in disaster, with its leader, Dr. Leander Star Jamison, being led away to jail in tears and in disgrace. The raid had far-reaching consequences, with Rhodes being forced to resign as governor of the Cape and the Transvaal being the Moorin with the British. British and Boer officials desperately ran around like headless chickens to avoid war, but war would eventually come in 1899. Nevertheless, in 1896, the rugby football union back in England seemed to feel that war and rugby should be kept apart. So they agreed to send the British Lions team, composed solely of players from England and Ireland. The Brits arrived at Cape Town docks and were once again led in a colourful, loud parade to the same hotel where they were led to five years earlier. Welcome to Cape Town. Let's see you this was a strong British Lions team, led by Johnny Hammond, a veteran of the first tour. His vice-captain was the charismatic and talented Irishman, Tommy Crean, who would become a legend not only in rugby circles, 
but also as a distinguished soldier and doctor. Respect. As in 1891, the 1896 tour was characterized as a noble challenge between gentlemen rather than a bitter conflict between rival nations. But it was clear to see by everyone that the South African teams had improved in quality since the last tour. South African supporters and neutral pundits were delighted to see Ferry's Western Province team hold the tourists to a no-all draw. Ferry was subsequently selected to play in the first test in Port Elizabeth and some were even expecting a first South African test victory. We can win. But their hopes came crashing down when Hammond's team defeated a disjointed South African team 8 to 0. Yeah, this one is a real, 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 real death. After the game, Ferry was unfairly and remorselessly attacked by the South African press, branded as worse than useless. As a result, he was dropped completely from the second test. The South Africans fared admirably in the second test, played in Johannesburg. They still lost, but managed to score their first points in international rugby, scoring two tries and converting one. The Brits also prevailed 9-3 in a tightly fought third test in Kimberley. As the fourth and final test was to be played at Newlands, the South African team selectors were all from Western Province, and they unanimously decided to recall their local boykie, Barry Heatley, from the rugby wilderness. It's time for you to take your rightful place. Now imagine Baz's surprise when he was told that not only would he be able to play in the final test, but he would lead the team out as captain as well. I can't believe it! It's just not believable! The fairy tale had just begun for Fairy Heaty. He immediately took advantage of the second chance he was given and swiftly took control of the team. Interestingly, in the six previous tests, the South Africans had worn whatever jerseys were available. Sometimes they were light colored, other days they were dark. Nobody had really minded what they wore. Oh my sweet Jesus. That's rad. It wasn't important at the time, but Ferry recognized the importance of wearing one jersey for all tests. A jersey not only symbolized the unity of a team, but it also showed the rest of the world who you were, who you represented. So Barry decided to take the issue into his own hands and provided his squad with a set of jerseys from his club, the Old Diocesan. These jerseys were myrtle green, and although he did not know it yet, Barry Heaty would become the father of the Springbok rugby jersey. On the 5th of September 1896, Newlands was ablaze with excitement. A mixed but mostly white crowd from a cross section of Cape Society was present, eager to see what the South African team could pull off with a new captain and a new jersey. A strong crosswind blew from the south as the referee blew his whistle for the game to begin. Ferry immediately stamped his authority on the game, getting into the faces of the Brits. Inspired by their captain, the South African forwards charged at the tourists, taking possession early on. Then, from a line-out, Tommy Queen won the ball for the Brits and fed it to their scrum off, Louis McGee. McGee passed it to Sidney Bell, who passed it to Fred Byrne at centre. Then, suddenly, Byrne was tackled by Ferdy Aston, who also happened to be the South African captain for the three previous tests. Another South African player, Betty Anderson, darted in and snatched the ball from Byrne's grasp, bursting free towards the British goal line. Anderson drew the fullback before passing to scrummy Alf Lerard, who scored beneath the posts, causing the Newlands crowd to collectively throw their bowler hats and walking sticks up into the windy Cape Town sky in sheer delight. Apparently, even the ladies in the crowd were acting rambunctiously, throwing items of clothing up into the air, though these items were not specified. Hammond protested to the ref, asking for the try to be disallowed and a penalty be awarded to the visitors, because he thought that Anderson had stolen the ball illegally from the ground. The moustache is rattled. 
However, the ref shook his head. Now, the ref in this game just so happened to be none other than Alf Richards, the South African captain of the third test from the 1891 tour. This it could be that old Alfie was keen on some revenge, or he genuinely did not see anything wrong with Anderson Steele. This little interview gave the Newlands crowd just enough time to regather their bowler hats in the gusty condition before Tommy Hepburn's successful conversion compelled the crowd to once again throw their recently regathered hats and walking sticks into the air. All of a sudden, the South Africans were leading 5 to 0, but it was still the first half, and Hammond and his men were determined to shake off the controversy and end the tour off on a high. They hit back hard for the remainder of the first half and into the second half but Ferry continued to rally his men in gallant defence. They threw themselves into each bone-crunching tackle. The British Lions launched wave after wave of attack on the South African goal line, but each time Ferry and his men drove them back. It was a playful war of attrition, something which would become a reality four years later with the outbreak of the Second Anglo-Boer War, or the South African War. But for now, it was non-lethal, though far from non-violent. The Brits desperately tried to gain the upper hand, but they were beat back each time. Then, as the early spring sun set behind Table Mountain, Alfie blew the final whistle, confirming South Africa's first ever victory in a test match. What a match! What a sport! Ferry was carried off the field on the shoulders of his fellow players as well as random spectators, instantly becoming a national hero. Of course, the Brits were a bit sour about their last game on tour ending in defeat. Indeed, even some South Africans were unable to accept that a colony had defeated the motherland. The situation's never been contemplated. Well, you better start contemplating! It had not happened before, and so the natural order of things was threatened. The Cape Times decided to side with the British lines, albeit passively aggressively, writing, it was a pity that the match should have been decided by what was after all a piece of sharp practice, implying that Anderson's rip from Byrne was illegal. Ferry brushed aside this kind of criticism. The Brits may have won the series 3-1, but South Africa had earned its first ever victory and its self-respect with him at the helm. However, the fairy tale was far from over for Ferry Heaty. Nothing is over! Nothing! Following the end of the South African War in 1902, the country was in a state of ruin. The war had left indelible scars, not only between the British and the now former Boer Republics, but also between those who had fought for the Crown and those who had fought with the Boers. The war was in many ways a civil war, which caused a deep tear in the social fabric of a still ununited South Africa. After the signing of the Treaty of Vereniging, which formally ended hostilities, British commander Lord Kitchener dryly declared, now we can all be friends again. So in 1903, a British Owls team agreed to tour South Africa primarily as a sign of reconciliation, but also in the hope that South Africa's splintered people would be joined once again by the spectacle of their team in action. It was expected that Ferry, the hero of 1896, would retain the captaincy for the first test match to be played in Johannesburg. But, while he was picked for the side, he was overlooked as captain by the Transvaal Rugby Union, who decided to select their own man as captain instead. It seems provincialism, the great plague of South African rugby, has a long history. The South Africans were lucky to draw the first test 10 all with the tourists. The second test was to be played in Kimberley, so the Grickland West Rugby Union appointed their man as captain. In any event, Ferry made himself unavailable for the second test so that he could be present for the birth of his second son. The second test was also a draw, so the third and final test in Cape Town would be the decider. Ferry was available once more and was promptly restored as captain. He and his fellow selectors then went about selecting the team that he wanted, the team he could trust to get the job done. He persuaded an emerging superstar of his time, Jaapie Krieger, 
to return from self-imposed exile after the disappointment of the first test. He also included a young and exciting winger called Bob Lobscher in the team. In Ferry's mind, the team was now at full strength. In the previous two tests, much to his disappointment, the South African team had not worn the myrtle green jerseys he had introduced in 1896. So Ferry went back to the same outfitter where he had found the set of old diocesan club jerseys. But the problem was that between 1896 and 1903, the old diocesan rugby club had ceased to exist. To his relief, the outfitter had one set of jerseys still remaining, so Ferry presented each of his teammates with a myrtle green jersey with white collar and a pair of black shorts. The day of the final test dawned, 12 September 1903. Expectations for a first ever series victory were high. Once again, Newlands prepared itself to host another historic landmark. The old field where spectators had packed around the touchline had now been built up into a sizable sporting stadium. The main stand provided no fewer than 25 rows of seating, which back in the day was quite substantial. On the day of the test match, it's said that a crowd of around 23,000 people greeted Ferry and his team as they made their way onto the pitch. Once again, Ferry led his men from the front, instilling confidence amongst his fellow forwards. As a result of the dominance of the forwards, the backs were able to get a lot more ball than in the previous two tests. This gave the likes of Kricker and Lowe the space they needed to wreak havoc in the British defensive line. Eventually, the South Africans triumphed 8-0 against the Brits, and hats and walking sticks and the like once more flew up into the Cape Town sky in celebration. For the very first time, a South African international team had won a test series. Unbelievable! Ladies and gentlemen, I have been to the Great Wall of China. I have seen the pyramids of Egypt. I've even witnessed a grown man satisfy a camel. But never in all my years as a sportscaster have I witnessed something as improbable, as impossible as what we've witnessed here today. And South Africa would not lose another test series against the British and Irish Lions until 1974. For Ferry, the third test of the 1903 tour would be his last for South Africa. He had played in six of the first ten international matches played by South Africa and had captained the side on two occasions, South Africa's first ever test victory as well as the match to secure South Africa's first ever series win. The fairy tale should have ended there for Ferry Heaty, but the life had other plans for him. In 1905, he and his family found themselves in severe financial difficulties, with his father facing insolvency. With his reputation in ruin, Baza, the once upon a time hero of South African rugby, left the country in shame, branded as a social pariah. He relocated to Argentina, and this is where yet another twist in Ferry Hiti's remarkable life occurred. Now this is exciting. There are so many twists and turns, I can't wait to see what's around the next bend. Once in the land of Tango and the famous Pichana steak, Baza reinvented himself as a hard-working businessman. Over the next 20 years, he rose to be general manager of a large sugar company. While there, he couldn't shrug off his undying love for the game of rugby, so he decided to share it with the people of Argentina. Rugby was largely unknown in Argentina at the time, but Ferry changed all that. With his typical forceful nature, he helped to nurture and develop Argentinian rugby. He even went on to be one of the founding fathers of the Argentinian national side, the Pumas. Muchas gracias, señor. Therefore, Baza has the distinct honor of being involved in the establishment of not only one, but two international teams. Finally, at the age of 49, he hung up his boots and retired from the game. Then, in 1925, with his family's reputation restored, Ferry returned to his homeland and resettled close to the Newlands ground which had been the birthplace of his legend. For the next 26 years, Baza lived quietly and peacefully. But in April 1951, on his way to an old diocesan dinner, 
he was knocked down by a car. He never fully recovered, and on the 19th of August of that same year, Barry Ferihiti, a true pioneer of South African rugby, passed away. He was 79. Ferry Heaty's most enduring legacy to South African rugby is of course the myrtle green colour of the jersey. At a meeting held on the 12th of September 1906, the South African Rugby Board formally adopted the colour as the official colours of the national team. By then, the board was contemplating South Africa's first overseas tour of Britain, which would herald the dawn of a new era, the introduction of Springbok Rugby. But that is a story for another time. As for Barry Heaty's story, it ultimately did have a fairy tale ending, albeit posthumously. Due to the embarrassment of his financial woes, he was not given the recognition he deserved for the tremendous contribution he made to rugby as a whole. But this changed in 2009 when he was inducted into World Rugby's Hall of Fame. As South Africa's fifth captain and the man who is responsible for the colour of one of the most iconic rugby jerseys of all time, Barry Ferihiti should rightfully be recognised as a true rugby legend. That's it for now. But before Stashy and I leave you, we'd like to remind you, if you want a particular topic to be done on the historian's stash or the historian's locker, please drop it down below in the comment section and we'll see whether we can dedicate an episode to your suggested topic. I've already gotten quite a few suggestions from a couple of subscribers, for which I'm very grateful for. So I'm working hard to make those potential episodes a reality. For those of you who have not subscribed yet, please do so to get the newest content from the Historian Stash YouTube channel. Subscription is free and you get to hear these incredibly lacquer stories from the past that rarely get spoken of. Wow, you make history come alive. So do yourself a favor, hit that like button, share this video and subscribe. Shop. Thumbs up! Until next time, stay stashy.